Hello, Olivet Baptist Church family. I'm glad you could join us on, for this midweek service. We want to start out, as always, with, uh, with people to pray for. And if you should have received, if you're a church member or on the internet list, or on the email list, rather, you should have received a, a prayer request. And so let me share that with you, some of those highlights of that with you, if I could. Be sure to pray for, uh, for uh, staff. And uh, we have several to list as well uh, this this week. Angie Spraggs is has a, having rotator cuff surgery on October 26th at uh, Lourdes Hospital, and we want to pray for Angie and also uh, the family and friends of Brian Powell. Brian passed away this last week, and he was a former uh, Olivet Baptist Church youth pastor and very well loved and well liked and i've heard a lot of great things about him and so we sure want to uh, keep his friends and and his family in our prayers and then as always in this coronavirus crisis we're still going through um, we want to remember the frontline personnel also the schools and the teachers and the students who are starting back um, and, and many have started back a long time ago and many are making a transition to do more full-time now than they were in the past, and uh, just all kinds of levels of need for prayer. So we want to ask you to pray for those folks. And then, of course, this weekend is a special weekend at Olivet Baptist Church, uh, and uh, you want to be sure and and uh, pray for the church, especially. Uh, pray for the uh, pastor search committee. Pray for the pers perspective uh Pastor, if you would, Pastor Chris and his family will be here uh, this weekend, and uh, he will be preaching in view of a call. So you be sure and, and pray for him, and pray for them, and pray for the church. Uh, there's a voting process that's been uh, established uh, by the church, and so there will be two ways of voting. One is for the in-person service. Others will be a drive-in. That's been announced a couple of times, and it'll be announced again Sunday, but if you can be here, uh, be sure and do that uh, this Sunday morning at 10 o'clock and uh, come and uh, listen to God's message. Uh, we sure want to continue to praying, pray for the church and for the, for the Lord's will be done and all of that. And we, we are grateful uh, for the work that the Pastor Search Committee has done and grateful that, um, that he, uh, he is honoring their work and uh, looking forward to the, to the life ahead of uh, whatever he chooses for us to do. And so let's go to the Lord in prayer together, could we? Father, thank you so much for your love. Thank you, dear Lord, for every blessing of life. We, um, we're so grateful to you for uh, everything. And we thank you for the opportunity we have to spend time in prayer and listening to you, and speaking to you, and I pray, dear Lord, that you'd bless each person that's uh, participating in this uh, online uh, midweek service. I pray, dear Lord, that you'd uh, be with uh, Pastor Chris and his family as they uh, travel here this weekend, uh, would be with him as he speaks, and uh, just uh, bless him in a very special way. Bless the congregation. Uh, be with the Pastor Search Committee as they continue to lead in this area. And I pray, dear Lord, that you'd lead every church member to, uh, to participate and do that in a way that honors and pleases you, and God, that you will be uh, lifted up in everything that we do. Thank you, Father, for these who are on the front lines of, uh, of serving uh, in our health institutions and all other ways, as far as schools and so forth. And we just, just thank you for each one and pray that you'll be with them in a very special way, too. Now. Now we pray you'll bless our time of Bible study and help us to see your word in a way that is fresh and new and uh, th that we can discover the truths that you want us to discover. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We um, have been studying now for, this is the sixth week, lesson six, uh, a thing that I'm calling, or a study that I'm calling a life of many colors. And uh, it's a study, really, of Joseph. And as we think about that, there's a lot of background information here that we've actually already traveled through, but it's helpful for us to, 
to be reminded of it and also helpful for us to to um, uh, to, to, to take a, a look at what what's happened so far in our study so we'll do that very quickly um, as we look at this me- message today or Bible study today that I've entitled love never fails which comes by the way from Genesis 41 beginning in verse 56 and goes all the way f- to chapter 42 verse 38 uh, and as we think about that, we, we know that our actions that we uh, engage in day to day can cause a lot of things in our life and the life of many people. Sometimes that can create guilt, and guilt's a terrible thing. Guilt can haunt us almost endless, endlessly. And yet the Bible teaches that our actions ought to be uh, motivated by love. And as we look at the background here, we see that Joseph's heritage is a great heritage. His ancestors were none other than Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Rachel, uh, and um, he had a great start in life. And as he continued his life, we pick up when he was about 17 years old in Genesis 37, and as a young man, he was favored by his father. In fact, the Bible says that his father loved him most, and Joseph had a little bit of a uh, problem, uh, thinking a little too highly of himself, perhaps. And uh, he had some dreams, and then he was, and that was good, and he was able to interpret those dreams, and that was good. But the problem was he was a little bit more outspoken than maybe he should have been in his youth and immaturity because he told his brothers and his mother and father about his dreams where they all bowed down to him, and the brothers just resented him, and they plotted against him, and some of them wanted to kill him. But what happened ultimately, instead of them actually killing him they they sold him to some ishmaelites who were going by some traveling ishmaelites who were going to egypt and uh he wound up there in egypt uh and actually in the house of uh, potiphar who was the captain of the guard for pharaoh and uh he went through temptations and trials there in fact potiphar's wife um lied about him tried to get him to sin, did all kinds of bad things, and he wouldn't give in to that. He he was a great man of character, but um, because of what she did, because of what she accused him of, he wound up in jail. But here again, Joseph prospered because the Lord always caused him to prosper. And we found out in Genesis 40 that trust is an important thing because he was true to continue to interpret dreams, one for a cupbearer that was thrown into prison, another for a baker that was thrown into prison, and and one dream was a great dream and a great prophecy, you might say, from the dream, and it came true, and the other one wasn't, and that came true too, but at least Joseph did tell the truth. He he spoke the truth, and even though it was a hard truth to tell, and he was a trustworthy person, and that's such an important thing. In their society, it was for them, and it's so so important for us today. Um, and then we find that Joseph's life made a, made a huge difference. And our life can make a huge difference too. Because um, ultimately, even though the cupbearer, when he left prison, was asked to remember Joseph, he didn't do it. But eventually he did. So he made that wrong right. And that was good. And we can do that too. We can make, regardless of when it is, it's never too late to make a, a wrong right. And uh, we find out that Joseph, in his interpretation of the Pharaoh's dream, uh, said that there needed to be someone who would manage resources well. And that's an important thing. That makes a huge difference, managing resources. And then Joseph's leadership. He was a great leader. And, uh, and he made a huge difference. And God worked through the events of his life as you look back on his life you can see how god was working all the time in his life to to enable him to make a huge difference in life and that brings us now to chapter 41 verse 56 so what's happened is joseph has has said in these dream interpretations for pharaoh that there's going to be seven years of famine uh, excuse me seven years of surplus (laughs) prosperity if you will and then seven years of famine so what he needed to do was manage the good years so that there was enough left over for the bad years. And in verse 56, all this came through because it says in verse 56 of chapter 41 of Genesis, 
When the famine was spread over all the face of the earth, then Joseph opened all the storehouses and sold to the Egyptians, and the famine was severe in the land. The people of all the earth came to Egypt to buy grain from Joseph because the famine was severe in all the earth. So not only did the people in Egypt buy grain from them, but also um, people from all over the world, the Bible said. And then if you move on to chapter 42, you find out that Jacob, the father, Joseph's father, sent uh, Joseph's brothers to Egypt. And, uh, and yet, the, the one who was left, Benjamin, the youngest one who was left, I should have said, stayed home. A- and when they got to Egypt to buy the grain, uh, Joseph saw them. And not only that, but he recognized them even though uh, they did not recognize him. And that's what it really tells us in chapter 42 in verses 1 through 8. But if you pick up in, first, in four, chapter 42, verse 9, you see that Joseph, now remember, he knows who they are. He, they don't know who he is. And, and, and it says in verse 9, Joseph remembered the dreams which he had about them and said to them, You are spies. You have come to look at the undefended parts of our land. Then they said to him, No, my Lord, but your servants have come to buy food. We are all sons of one man. We are honest men. Your servants are not spies. Yet he said to them, No, but you have come to look at the undefended parts of our land. But they said, Your servants are twelve brothers in all, the sons of one man in the land of Canaan. And behold, the youngest is with our father today, and one is no longer alive. Now you realize that the one who is no longer alive they're speaking about is actually alive because he's listening to their story. In verse 14, Joseph said to them, It is as I said to you, you are spies. By this you will be tested. By the life of Pharaoh, you shall not go from this place unless your youngest brother comes here. Send one of you that, that he may get your brother while you remain confined, that your words may be tested whether there is truth in you. But if not, by the life of Pharaoh, surely you are spies. And so what Joseph did in one way is he tested them, or at least he said he was going to test them in this way. He assigned this test. And one brother was to go back, and they could decide whoever that was going to be, and to get uh, the, the youngest brother that was left, Benjamin. And if he did not return, then guess what? Truth comes out, you are actually spies. But if he does come back, then evidently your story must be true. And he put them in in prison for three days. It tells us that in verse 17. And then when we pick up in verse 18, we find what I call the plan B for the test. Because for whatever reason, he decides, well, instead of that, I'm going to send all of you but one back. So Simeon's going to stay with me. He's going to stay with me as a hostage, and then the rest of you can go back and, um, and, and get your brother. And so as we pick up in verse 21, and this is a little bit, the, the twists and turns are a little bit hard to follow here, but it says, Then they said to one another, Truly we are guilty concerning our brother, because we saw the distress of his soul when he pleaded with us, yet we would not listen. Therefore this distress has come upon us. Reuben answered them. Now remember, Reuben's the one that didn't want him to kill him. Did I not tell you, do not sin against the boy, and you would not listen? Now comes the reckoning for his blood. Now this is a very interesting twist or turn, whichever one you want to call it. Because what's happening is Joseph is sending back not one brother, like he said at the beginning, but all the brothers but one. (laughs) And then out of the blue almost, as they make their preparations and make on the trip, they start talking about what they had done back to Joseph. And we find out that that, that's on their mind. Something has triggered them to think about that. Um, They're feeling guilty for that. And as we move on, uh, after they express the guilt, we find in verse 23, it says, They did not know, however, that Joseph understood, for there was an interpreter between them. And then it says, he turned away from them and wept. But when he returned to them and spoke to them, he took Simeon from them and bound him before their eyes. Then Joseph gave orders to fill their bags with grain and to restore every man's money in his sack and to give them provisions for the journey, and thus it was done for them. 
So they loaded their donkeys with their grain and departed from there. As one of them opened his sack to give his donkey fodder at the lodging place, he saw his money, and behold, it was in the mouth of his sack. Then he said to his brothers, My money has been returned, and behold, it is even in my sack. And you might think that they go, Wow, that's really cool. But what they did was, they said, or it says here that, And their hearts sank, and they turned trembling to one another, saying, What is this? that God has done to us. And so you can see that here's further the test. Joseph's a wise guy, wise man, <laughs> and, um, and he basically hides the money that they brought to buy grain with, and so he gives them the grain and the money, and then gives them the money back, as I said. But here's the deal. You would think that would be a really positive thing in their life, but what? No, the grief comes back. And then, if you went on and read the rest of the story all the way through verse 38 of chapter 42, you'd find a couple of things. Once, one, when they discovered the refund, they were afraid. And then you'd find them arriving in Canaan, the nine brothers now that are left, one's back with Joseph, <laughs> one of them is Joseph, and uh, the nine that are left are talking to their dad, and as they return, uh, they they decided that to tell Jacob the story, and when they did, he refused to let Benjamin return. Now, another time, we'll pick up where that leaves off, and we'll find out what happens, because there's going to be another twist and turn that goes on as we move on. But I think we need to stop right there and say, what can we learn from this passage that we've really read through and sped through in, in these moments? Because as you look at kind of a review of that, you can see that the famine spread. People all over the earth came to Egypt for food. Jacob sent his brothers to Egypt to buy food. Joseph accused them of spies and assigned them a test. Then he had plan B and assigned a different test. The brothers expressed guilt for their previous sins, Joseph sends them away. And when they discover their refund, guess what? <laughs> They're afraid. What's that from? Guilt from their previous sin. And then they arrive back in Canaan. That's the story. So what can we learn from the story? The story that, we, that I believe we can learn is this. Two major ideas. One is guilt can haunt us. Guilt can haunt us. And I want you to know that I thought long and hard about that word haunt <laughs> because I, I want you to know too that I don't believe in ghosts. <laughs> and uh, now, Holy Ghost, as a King James calls the Holy Spirit, that's fine. But as far as ghosts like Halloween, Casper the Ghost, I don't believe in that. But the word haunt it is an interesting word because what it really means in this setting, when I'm using it here, I looked it up and what it, one meaning of the word is this, Haunt is to frequent or to have a disquieting or harmful effect on a person. Guilt can haunt us almost endlessly. And I can tell you from personal experience, when we feel guilty, it's hard to get over that. When we do, we need to confess that, but it's still hard to get over. And the brothers did not know who he was. How in the world could they have assigned this thing that they had done so long ago to him by first wanting to kill him and then selling him to these people going through who took him to Egypt? And, and they thought he was dead by now. That didn't come up because they ran into Joseph because they didn't know who he was. That came up because that guilt was haunting them. And they didn't seem to disagree about what they were feeling at the time. I believe that guilt was haunting, it, haunting them. And they thought, and you, you can see this in verse 22, they thought the punishment had finally arrived. I remember one church I served in a long, long time ago. I've even forgotten the fellow's name. Sometimes I'm so grateful that it's been long enough I've forgotten names. <laughs> but we found out that one of the church maintenance staff, we'll call it, um, who reported to me, by the way, one of those guys, his uh, 
daughter called our daycare office. And he had been accused long years before that of indecent behavior with some of the grandchildren. And so we had to investigate that the best we could. But with having a daycare there and having children on campus five days a week, we couldn't let that go. And so we confronted him, and it's too long a story, but we gave him an opportunity to redeem himself and to do some things that would make that right. And he said he would. But what was so interesting to me, and the reason I'm telling you that story is this, that one of the events of that was the day after we confronted him, he came to me and he said, I could tell by the way your wife looked at me that you told her. And the reason he said that, I'm sure, is because we had said to him, now this is confidential. And he thought I'd gone home and told my wife. Well, the truth is, he thought he could tell <laughs> that I'd told my wife because of the way he looked, she looked at him. But I had not told her. She had no clue. I had not, I had not voiced one word about that or hinted one time about that. And yet he thought I had. That was guilt. The guilt was haunting him. And it'll do that. And we need to remember... <laughs> to take appropriate actions because guilt can haunt us. And when guilt haunts us, we need to confess our sin. The Bible says God is faithful and just to forgive us our sin. The second thing that's kind of a major idea here, I just call it love never fails. Now, interestingly enough, if you look at this, even though the brothers, his brothers, Joseph's brothers, did not know him, he knew them. And he could have gloated. In fact, when they first came in to buy the food, it says in, uh, in verse 6 that they bowed down to him. Remember the first dream and the second dream when he was a 17-year-old boy? <laughs> and he told them, some of these days you're going to bow down to me. He could have jumped up and hollered and hooped and gloated, said, I told you so. Remember all those years ago? Here, I'm Joseph, and now here you are bowing down to me. He could have done that. He could have said, my boyhood dreams have come true. He could have had them killed. <laughs> he had that much power. Instead, the Bible says in verse 24, that he turned away from them and wept. He turned away from them and wept. And he was concerned about their welfare. In fact, Joseph met their needs. They wanted him to be dead. At least they had er years earlier. They wanted him to be dead. But he gave them an opportunity to prove themselves to be faithful. You might say to redeem themselves as far as that one act goes. He gave them an opportunity to prove themselves to be faithful. Joseph met their needs. Let me read a very familiar passage. 1 Corinthians 13, beginning in verse 4, says this. Love is patient. Love is kind and is not jealous. Love does not brag and is not arrogant, does not act unbecomingly, it does not seek its own, is not provoked, does not take into account a wrong suffered, does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. That's where I got the title. Because when I thought about this idea of love and how Joseph treated them with kindness, with compassion, with love, when he had, you might say, a right to do something very different from the way they had treated them, he thought of them, and he gave them the opportunity they needed, an opportunity to make things right. He gave them an opportunity to prove themselves to be faithful, as he had proven himself to be faithful in the ups and downs of life, all the way from start to finish. Some of our actions can cause us to experience guilt, and that can haunt us almost endlessly. We need to be careful to avoid sinful behaviors. But when we find ourselves feeling guilty, if it's justified, and if we should feel guilty because of what we've done, we need to confess it to God. And then the Bible teaches us that all our actions should be motivated by love, which never fails. I also thought 
as I wrapped up this study for me, I thought of a book that I read a long, long, long time ago. It was called Concentric Circles of Concern. The author was Oscar Thompson. Oscar Thompson was an evangelism professor at Southwestern Seminary. Actually, while he was still teaching there, he, he got cancer and eventually died. His wife actually wrote the book, Concentric Circles of Concern, using the notes that he taught from at the seminary. And I don't remember everything about that book. I could spend a few minutes telling you some things about the book. But interestingly enough, I don't think I'll ever forget the theme of the book. And the theme was that love, like the Bible speaks of, that I read to you a while ago, agape love, that never fails. It's meeting needs. He said love isn't a feeling. Love isn't some kind of romantic thing. Love is meeting needs. If you love someone, if you really care about them, you will treat them in a way that you want to be treated. You will follow the golden rule. You, if you really love someone, you will meet their needs. We meet people's needs in all kinds of ways. One way we meet their needs is to tell them about Jesus. Joseph is a great example here of someone who met needs, someone who allowed love to motivate him rather than all the other things that could have motivated him. I encourage you to think about that and uh, join me in trying to be a person who remembers because of my, or that from my actions and by my actions, that guilt can cause us and to be haunted, it can haunt us almost endlessly. So watch my behavior. And then also, help, I pray that God will help me to remember and you to remember that love never fails. Even though Joseph could have gloated, even though he could have done bad things to them, instead he wept because he cared about them. He loved them. And in this case, he gave them an opportunity to make things right. He met their needs. I hope you'll be in our service on Sunday morning at 10 o'clock and that you will be here for that special day. If you can't be here, I hope you'll participate by watching online, 10 o'clock Sunday morning. In the meantime, don't forget to take care of yourself, take care of your family, and take care of your church family.